Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm honored to be joined by Prime Minister Lufen of Sweden at our first meeting in the White House. Sweden is one of our oldest and closest partners and was among the first European nations to offer the United States an unsolicited treaty of friendship, a treaty signed, believe it or not, in 1783. That's a long time ago. My daughter, Ivanka, had a wonderful time watching American and Swedish athletes compete in the recent men's curling final at the Olympics. <laughs> that was something. Huh? I was a little upset, but that wasn't expected, but that's okay. We'll take it, right? All of the athletes should be immensely proud of the great job they did. The Prime Minister and I have just concluded a series of very productive meetings. The relationship between the United States and Sweden is one based on shared values, including respect for individual rights, the rule of law, and human dignity. These common principles are the foundation of our partnership, and we have had a great partnership for many years. We look forward to exploring further opportunities to increase our security and our cooperation in every other way, and we encourage nations around the world to share responsibility for our common defense. We appreciate Sweden's leadership on the United Nations Security Council and look very much forward to working together in the coming months. The United States is also grateful to Sweden for advocating for Americans detained in North Korea. I particularly want to thank the Swedish government for its assistance in securing the release of American college student Otto Warmbier last year. Terrible, tragic event. We continue to pray for Otto's parents, Fred and Cindy, two terrific people, over the tragic death of their son, and we remain determined to achieve a denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula. And there's been a lot of news on that today. Hopefully, it's positive. Hopefully, it will lead to a very positive result. In economic matters, we are striving for a relationship grounded in fairness and reciprocity. The United States is one of the largest investors in Sweden, and the Swedish investments in the United States support over 200,000 American jobs. Earlier this afternoon, I heard from several Swedish business executives, some of the greatest in the world. Where are you, folks? Please. Some of the great executives in the world, people I've known for a long time and certainly know of. And they're investing tremendous amounts of money in the United States and supporting also vocational training for American workers. We are grateful for those investments, and we are committed to working with Sweden to pursue even greater economic cooperation. We're also continuing to pursue bilateral agreements to advance mutual prosperity. I'm pleased that Sweden intends to procure the Patriot air and missile defense system finest in the world, in a deal worth over $3 billion. This system will increase stability and security in the Baltic Sea region. A strong and balanced economic relationship strengthens security and prosperity in both of our countries. And this is just the beginning. We have a lot of things that we're working on, and we're working on them really very hard. Mr. Prime Minister, I want to thank you again for joining us. and. I want to thank your great staff, who we've met with, and your great business leaders. It was a very interesting and productive meeting. The longstanding friendship between our people, anchored in our shared beliefs and values, has greatly enriched both of our countries. And this is just the beginning. Our relationship has never been better. An honor to have you here. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. President, for a warm and generous welcome. It is a true pleasure to be here at the White House. This year, Sweden and the United States celebrate 200 years of diplomatic relations. And this meeting I, I reaffirms the strength of, of our relations. Uh, the history has shown that our two nations share fundamental values and interests, such as democracy and human rights. We also share a strong partnership that continues to evolve. Today, we have discussed uh, how to further strengthen our country's prosperity and security, 
As for prosperity, Sweden is one of the largest per capita investors in the United States, and my country may not be big, but we support directly and indirectly almost one million jobs in the United States. And some key uh, executives of the companies that provides these jobs are also here with me uh, at this visit. At the same time, the United States is our most important foreign employer and many U.S. companies play a, a vital role in providing investment and creating jobs in Sweden. President Trump and I have discussed how our nations can support jobs and growth. It's a crucial issue for Sweden. That means embracing uh, new uh, sustainable technologies which permit our economy to grow at the same time reducing emissions and also how we can secure good jobs in a, in a labor market constantly changing due to automation and digitalization. Sweden and the United States are two of the most innovative economies in the world, and we see great opportunities ahead. Swedish prosperity is built on cooperation, competitiveness, and free trade. And I'm convinced that increased tariffs will hurt us all in the long run. And as a Swede, I, of course, support the efforts of the European Union to achieve trade with fewer obstacles and as few as possible. Turning to security, the President and I have discussed some key regional and global security challenges, such as the situation on the Korean Peninsula, but also the, the developments in, in Sweden's neighborhood. We have also addressed the constructive cooperation between Sweden and the United States in the United Nations Security Council. I would like to underline that the transatlantic link is strong and it remains crucial to responding to global security challenges. Sweden is a military non-aligned country, but we build security in partnership with others and we greatly value our broad security and defense cooperation with the United States. And one important example of that is our joint efforts to, to fight and combat terrorism. Sweden and the United States stand shoulder to shoulder in the global coalition against ISIS and also in the resolute support mission in Afghanistan. And these vital military efforts must go hand in hand with strong political, diplomatic, and also civilian support to create sustainable results. So in conclusions, as we celebrate 200 years of diplomatic relations, we are also planning for shared prosperity and security for many, many years to come. And once again, I thank you, Mr. President, for a constructive and a successful meeting and for the very warm welcome that both my delegation and I received. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. John. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, you spoke about North Korea in the Oval Office, so I'd like to turn to trade if I could. My understanding is that the Prime Minister came to you with a message from the European Union Commission President saying, if you put tariffs on steel and aluminum, we'll slap you back with punitive tariffs on bourbon and jeans and the motorcycles that you talk about from Wisconsin. Uh, are you still planning on going ahead with these tariffs? There are some people in your party who have suggested it's not a good idea. And, and Prime Minister Levine, what's your perspective on, on tariffs and what message did you convey to the President uh, from Sweden and from the European Union? Thank you. Well, the United States has been taken advantage of by other countries, both friendly and not so friendly, for many, many decades. And we have a trade deficit of $800 billion a year. And that's not going to happen with me. Uh, we have been mistreated by many, uh, sometimes fairly, but uh, there are really very few instances where that's taken place. And I don't blame the countries. I blame our leadership for allowing it to happen. When I was with President Xi in China, as an example, we lose $500 billion a year on trade. We have a deficit of approximately $500 billion a year with China. And we're doing things with China, which are very strong, but they understand it. But I was with him, and I said to him in public, I said, look, I'm not blaming you. I blame our people for not doing a better job for allowing this to happen. But it's like that with many 
countries other than smaller. The European Union has been particularly tough on the United States. Uh, they make it almost impossible for us to do business with them, and yet they send their cars and everything else back into the United States. And they can do whatever they'd like, but if they do that, then we put a big tax of 25 percent on their cars. And believe me, they won't be doing it very long. The European Union has not treated us well. And it's been a very, very unfair trade situation. I'm here to protect. And one of the reasons I was elected is I'm protecting our workers, I'm protecting our companies, and I'm not going to let that happen. So we're doing tariffs on steel. We cannot lose our steel industry. It's a fraction of what it once was. And we can't lose our aluminum industry, also a fraction of what it once was. And our country is doing well. The massive tax cuts and all of the deregulation has really kicked us into gear. But I have to work on trade deals. We're working on NAFTA right now. And if we're able to make a deal with Canada and Mexico in NAFTA, then there will be no reason to do the tariffs with Canada and Mexico. But again, other countries, uh, we won't have that choice. And unless they can do something for us. As an example, if the European Union takes off some of the horrible barriers that make it impossible for our product to go into there, then we can start talking. Otherwise, we're going to leave it the way it is. So the fact is, we've been mistreated as a country for many years, and it's just not going to happen any longer. How do you avoid this escalating? How do you avoid this escalating into a trade war? Well, it's, we'll have to see. You know, when we're behind on every single country, trade wars aren't so bad. Do you understand what I mean by that? When we're down by 30 billion, 40 billion, 60 billion, 100 billion, the trade war hurts them, doesn't hurt us. So we'll see what happens. You know, you can also take it. In some cases, we lose on trade, plus we give them military where we're subsidizing them tremendously. So not only do we lose on trade, we lose on military. So, and hence, we have these massive deficit numbers in our country. Uh, we're going to straighten it out. And we'll do it in a, in a very loving way. It'll be a loving, loving way. They'll like us better. And they will respect us much more. Because even they say, right now, they say, we can't believe we've gotten away I mean, two countries have said, we cannot believe, to be honest with you, we've gotten away with this so long. Now, one of them made that statement before I got elected. He said, I can't believe I made that statement before I got elected. But it's one of those things. We have to straighten it out. We really have no choice. And, Mr. Prime Minister, how, how forceful was your message to the President on, on what the consequences will be if he goes ahead with tariffs? No, first, uh, uh, trade is a European Union mandate. So we're a member of the, the European Union. It's a European mandate to, to, to handle trade issues. But as a, as a member uh, of the European Union, I think it's uh, important for us to try to find a way to cooperate between the European Union and the United States. I fully understand and respect the President's view that we have to uh, look after uh, his own country, the, the country that you're leading. I understand that fully. That's my primary task as well. Uh, but for me, leading a small country, uh, depending on, on open trade, uh, we, the best way for us is to, to do that with others. Because uh, our export equals to 50% of our GDP. So for us, it is crucially important that, that we have this open and free trade. Today also, I believe that the, the supply chains are very, very complicated to see. I know that, for, for example, when we, when we sell our fighter aircraft, which is a very good aircraft, uh, uh, the content is perhaps 50% American. So uh, we want this to be, to be resolved uh, in cooperation. And when it comes to steel, yes, we have an overcapacity in the world. That's, that's uh, obvious. Um, but at the same time, it is China that is producing about 50% of the steel in the world. So, and, and European Union, perhaps 10% and, and less than that. So, uh, to summarize, I think it was a pity. Again, it's a European Union mandate, but it was a pity also that the TTIP negotiations ended because 
perhaps in, with negotiations and talks, we can come into a situation where the European Union and the United States can cooperate. I think that would be a very good uh, solution. Just to add maybe a little bit further, um, if you talk China, I've watched where the reporters have been writing 2% of our steel comes from China. Well, that's not right. They transship all through other countries. And you'll see that a country that doesn't even have a steel mill is sending us 3% steel for our country. And many countries are doing it. But it comes from China. So China doesn't send us 2%. They send us a much, much higher level than that. But it's called transshipping. So it doesn't look good when it all comes out of China. So they send it through other countries, and it comes to us. And it's putting our steel mills out of business. Our aluminum mills are going out of business. And we need steel, and we need aluminum. And you know, there's a theory that if a country doesn't have steel, it doesn't have a country. And it's true. So this is more than just pure economics. This is about defense. This is about the country itself. But again, remember this. We lose $800 billion a year in trade. And I think I was elected at least partially on this issue. And I've been saying it for 25 years. Our country has been taken advantage of by everybody. By everybody. Almost everybody. And we cannot let that happen any longer. Not for our companies and not, most importantly, for our workers. So we're not going to let it happen. Please. Okay, uh, Tina TT News Agencies. So, Mr. President, thank you for hosting us. Um, you mentioned that Sweden has helped the United States with North Korea. Um, how do you see your collaboration in the future to create a future uh, peaceful Korean peninsula? How do you see Sweden's role there? Uh, how do you both view the collaboration? And uh, as a follow-up to that, as I may, um, Mr. President, I know that you've followed the development in Sweden closely, especially when it comes to immigration politics. Now that you've spent some time with our Prime Minister, how do you view Sweden in general? What is your take in, and also on our immigration politics? Thank you. I think you. you have a wonderful Prime Minister, I have to say. We've gotten to know each other. Uh, certainly, you have a problem with the immigration. It's caused problems in Sweden. I was one of the first ones to say it. Uh, I took a little heat. But that was okay, because I proved to be right. But you do have a problem, and uh, I know the problem will slowly disappear, hopefully rapidly disappear. But as far as our relationship with Sweden, it's going to be only stronger, only better, both in a military sense, in a trading sense, in an e economic sense. You know, Sweden is, a, I think, the largest, uh, the eighth largest investor in the United States. And they like me very much because the market is up almost 40 percent since Election Day. So I've made a lot of these business geniuses look even better. So they like Trump. But, but you know, it's been up very substantially. But I believe Sweden is about the eighth largest investor in the United States. And that's quite a, an achievement. How about the collaboration on North Korea? Uh, we've been working on North Korea. Sweden has somewhat of a relationship with North Korea. We've been working with North Korea. As I said, Otto was really brought home, unfortunately, in very poor condition. But Otto was brought home largely with the help of Sweden. Uh, they're terrific, terrific people. People from Sweden. The Swedish people are fantastic people. I have many friends in New York, in Washington, from Sweden. And uh, they are fantastic people. Thank you. And Mr. Prime Minister, how do you view Sweden and North Korea and the U.S. We, we have to find a, a dialogue. I know it, it's, not, it's not easy, but that's the way it has to be. It's a very dangerous situation, and we, we need all to be very concerned about the development of, of nuclear weapon. Um, but we, we must look at the, the, the peninsula, the region, the world, and this has to do with, with world peace or, or something else. So the key actors is, is obviously the two countries, South and North Korea, as well as the United States and, and other uh, big countries. They are the key actors. We've said that we can provide, we can, we can uh, uh, be a channel uh, or, or do whatever we can uh, to see that the dialogue is, is smooth, not being naive. It's not, it's not up to us to solve this problem. But we can definitely, with our long presence, 
on the peninsula, both in South and North. We have a, an embassy in Pyongyang, for example. We've had that since 1973. So with that relation with North Korea, I believe that they trust us. We're a non-aligned country, and I, non, a military non-aligned country, and I think we can, we can uh, if, if the president decides, or the, the key actors decide, if they want us to, to help out, we'll be there. They really have been terrific, really terrific. Sager and Jetty, Daily Caller, please. Sager. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, since it's my first time before you, I thought you might indulge me with two questions. First, sir, do you believe that North Korea's recent willingness to talk is sincere, or is it an effort to buy time for their nuclear program? And to what do you owe this recent uh, openness to talk? Me. No, I think that <laughs> nobody got that. I think that they are sincere, but I think they're sincere also because the sanctions and what we're doing with respect to North Korea, including, you know, the great help that we've been given from China. And they can do more, but I think they've done more than certainly they've ever done for our country before. So China has been a big help. I think that's uh, been a factor. But the sanctions have been very, very strong and very biting. And we don't want that to happen. So I really believe they are sincere. I hope they're sincere. We're going to soon find out. That you would like to see some change in the people around you. Does that include your Attorney General Jeff Sessions or well, either of your yeah. Cabinet Secretaries? No, I don't, I don't really talk about that. I just said that uh, the White House has tremendous energy. It has tremendous spirit. It is a great place to be working. Uh, many, many people want every single job. You know, I read where, oh, gee, maybe people don't want to work for Trump. And believe me, everybody wants to work in the White House. They all want a piece of that Oval Office. They want a piece of the West Wing. And not only in terms of it looks great on their resume, it's just a great place to work. It's got tremendous energy. It's tough. I like conflict. I like having two people with different points of view, and I certainly have that. And then I make a decision. But I like watching it, I like seeing it, and I think it's the best way to go. I like different points of view. But the White House has a tremendous energy, and we have tremendous talent. Yeah, there'll be people, I'm not going to be specific, but there'll be people that change. They always change. Sometimes they want to go out and do something else, but they all want to be in the White House. So many people want to come in. I have a choice of anybody. I could take any position in the White House, and I'll have a choice of the 10 top people having to do with that position. Everybody wants to be there. And they love this White House because we have energy like rarely before. Okay? Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Mr. Please. Prime Minister, uh, last year you criticized the President for drawing a link between immigrant crime and uh, the recent arrivals of refugees. This week, one of our own flagship papers, the New York Times, actually profiled a link between hand grenade violence and immigrant gangs in your country. Do you stand by your criticism of the President? First, uh, Sweden, we, we have our share of domestic challenges, no doubt about that. So, and we inherited a legislation that was not sustainable, uh, legislation on migration, uh, m which uh, meant that in, in 2015, we received 163,000 refugees seeking refuge. Uh, uh, bear in mind, we're a country of 10 million inhabitants, so that was a lot. 70% of them came from September to December, which meant it was a dramatic increase. We changed the legislation, so now we have decreased the number of refugees entering Sweden, and we're also putting pressure on the other European Union countries to take their share of the responsibility. This is not a responsibility for one, two, three, or four countries. It is a shared responsibility. We're working with that now within the European Union. Uh, so, um, and we, we, of course, we also have uh, problems with crime, organized crime in Sweden, shootings. But it's not like you have these no-go zones. Uh, we, we, have, uh, we have dealt with it. I'm dealing with it every day, allocating more resources to the police, more policemen trained, uh, more resources to the security police, uh, tougher law on crime, tougher law on terrorism supporting terrorism, so we do a lot to combat that. And we can also see 
some results now in, in our three major cities, decreased shootings because we're attacking the organized crime very tough. And we'll keep on doing that because there is no space in Sweden for organized crime because they, they, uh, they uh, decrease freedom for, for ordinary people. At the same time, Sweden have a high growth. Unemployment is going down. Employment is going up. We have high investment rates. Uh, we're allocating uh, resources to the welfare. We have a strong, strong economy with a, with a surplus, a huge surplus that we're now using to, to develop our society uh, with, for example, the, the welfare that we, that we want. So the pictures we need to be, it's two pictures. Yes, we have our share of domestic problems and challenges, no doubt about that, we're, but we're dealing with them. And we also have a, a good, a good uh, foundation for dealing with them, not least uh, with the strong economy and uh, the shrinking unemployment. Okay, so it's Kaisa Swedish Radio. Thank you. Uh, this is an election year for both of our countries. And I want to ask you, Mr. Trump, what do you think Sweden should learn from how the Russian influence campaign affected the presidential election in the U.S.? Well, the Russians had no impact on our votes whatsoever. Uh, but certainly there was meddling, and probably there was meddling from other countries and maybe other individuals. And I think you have to be uh, really watching very closely. You don't want your system of votes to be compromised in any way. And we won't allow that to happen. We're doing a very, very deep study, and we're coming out with some, I think, very strong suggestions on the 18 election. I think we're going to do very well in the 18 election, although historically, those in the White House have a little bit of a dip. But I think we're going to do well because the economy is so good and because we're protecting our job like our jobs are being protected, finally, like with what we're doing with the tariffs. But the big thing would be the tax cut and the regulations cuts. Uh, also, the judges. I mean, we have outstanding judges. Judge Gorsuch in the Supreme Court and many, many judges going onto the bench all over the country. So I think we're going to do very well. Uh, and I think it'll be a tremendous surprise to people how well it's uh, — the economy is so good, jobs are so good. Black unemployment, Hispanic unemployment at all-time lows. I mean, we're really — we're really doing well. So based on that, I guess we should do pretty well, and I hope so. But you have to be very vigilant. And one of the things we're learning is it's always good. It's old-fashioned, but it's always good to have a paper backup system of voting. It's called paper, not highly complex computers, paper. And a lot of states are doing that. They're going to a paper backup and I think that's a great idea. But we're studying it very closely. Various agencies, including Homeland Security, are studying it very carefully. But are you worried about Russia trying to meddle in the midterm election? No, because we'll counteract whatever they do. We'll counteract it very strongly. And we are having strong backup systems. And we've been working, actually, uh, we haven't been given credit for this, but we've actually been working very hard on the 18 election and the 20 election coming up. Thank you very much. Mr. Levian, um, are you guys on the same page when it comes to evaluating the threat from Russia when it comes to meddling in elections, you think? Well, we, we both uh, agree upon that the, the election in a country should, uh, the result of the election in a country should be decided by nobody else but the voters in that country. And that is also our clear stance. And that is why our Intelligence agencies are now also increasing their own capacity to detect and counter, whether it's hacker attacks or, or, uh, or financing or producing or, or spreading propaganda, whatever it is. Uh, we are increasing our capacity to handle that. We are cooperating with other European Union countries. Some of our agencies are also cooperating with, with American counterparts. And this we will continue to do. And so any foreign power that, that believes that they can interfere with our election, we will find out and we will call them out very clearly and loud. And this is the first time that you two meet, just the two of you. Where did you find most common ground and where do you differ most on political issues? <laughs> we, 
We uh, first we 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 maybe almost everything. <laughs> yeah, we no first we 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 um, we I mean we we both come from outside politics uh, into politics. Uh, I've spent perhaps thirty years in in industry uh, as a welder, uh, but also as a trade unionist, but a uh, trade union leader, uh, spending seventy five eighty percent of my time cooperating with the company leaders with the employers organization in an effort to, to strengthen our industry. So that's a, perhaps a, a, a similar background, not similar because uh, uh, it's different, but, but we come from outside politics. But of course, also friends differ from time to time. Uh, the Paris Agreement, the, the importance of Paris Agreement, we stand by that. We think it's very important that we implement and, and fulfill the Paris Agreement because of the, the, the climate issue. And on that we might differ, tariffs as well. But having said that, still we know that the relationship is a good yes. So we can take uh, that we differ as well, because the values are there and we cooperate very, very good on economic issues, uh, making sure that we create jobs uh, and growth, and uh, also on security issues, both when it comes to combating terrorism, but also uh, when it comes to to uh, defend ourselves. Just. Finally, follow up for Mr. Trump. Do you think that tr trade is where Sweden and U.S. differ most right now? Oh, I think we have very good relationships on trade. Uh, we have had, and uh, uh, we are constantly in touch. We have, uh, on the military, great cooperation, including design of various components of aircraft, etc. And we are, we were discussing that we have some of the great makers of these components in the room with us today. Now, we have a very good relationship on trade, and we always will have. Sweden's a great country. It's small, but it's very sharp, I will tell you. They are very sharp. Thank you very much, everybody. I appreciate it. Thank you. President Trump wrapping up a joint press conference with the Prime Minister of Sweden uh, live at the White House right now. He was asked about uh, tariffs, North Korea, and staff turmoil. Hi, everyone. I'm ABC News political director Rick Klein, joined here by Catherine Falders. And uh, we've got Mary Bruce up on Capitol Hill. And Mary, I want to start with you because, uh, to my mind, uh, a little bit of, of a shift, maybe a, a very subtle one on the issue of tariffs. Uh, on one hand, the president saying we are going to impose those tariffs, but at the same time, he seems to be offering allies a bit of an off-ramp, saying it might be part of negotiations as part of NAFTA or with European countries. A lot of this has to be uh, responding to the pressure he's getting back on Capitol Hill. A lot of the president's allies not happy with what they've been hearing on tariffs. Yeah, and the president and the White House seem to be sending a lot of mixed messages here, Rick. That, of course, not something new for this administration. But really, over the last 24 hours, we've seen something up here that I can't remember really seeing in recent month, months, with, which is Republican leaders really forcefully coming out against the president. You had Speaker Ryan yesterday coming out in a way that, that I don't recall ever seeing him come out against this president, opposing this move on tariffs. The Republicans argue this is bad for the economy, that it will lead to a trade war. Now, you did hear the president there clearly disagreeing. In fact, he he said, and I quote, that the trade wars aren't so bad, uh, that, that he seems to be welcoming such a thing, suggesting that, that, that somehow if a trade war, war were to result, that, that America would somehow benefit while other countries would be the ones to suffer. Um, Republican leaders have been trying. They've been lobbying really hard. The president, uh, top White House aides behind the scenes to get them to, to walk this back, to not take these steps. It's unclear how much of an impact that's going to have. And remember, Republicans, all of this comes as Republicans continue to try and highlight and tout and sell uh, their tax reform bill. And they feel very strongly that if the president goes through with these tariffs, that it could put at risk some of the successes and gains gains that they feel have been made from their tax plan, their signature legislative achievement. Uh, and Mary, it's not just, it's not just the, the concern on Capitol Hill, it's inside the president's own staff. And Catherine, uh, you were noticing an empty chair in that room that, that might speak pretty loudly about some of the internal staff dissension on this issue of tariffs. Right. We didn't see Gary Cohn in there, who has been trying to avoid this 
trade war in a sense, persuading the president um, out of this. And, and I was just observing the room there and didn't see him in there and perhaps uh, maybe a little bit of an indication on how he feels um, on this issue. But it, it just as you mentioned, as Mary mentioned on Capitol Hill, uh, the same thing going on um, inside the White House with his staff to two different sides of this argument. And the president did, Catherine, address the staff turmoil, at least uh, indirectly. He said he's not going to talk about the attorney general. I guess he just tweets about, <laughs> He'll the, just tweet about, about the attorney general. Uh, John Carl, uh, in the room for that uh, for that news conference today, uh, I, I want to hit on this issue of the staff turmoil. The president seems to indicate that there will be more movement, but I, I think this, this the issue that he talks about there, about how much he likes that creative tension, that's about as frank an admission as you get from the president about that atmosphere that surrounds him. Uh, it was an interesting description of the uh, of the Trump method uh, that I'd never heard directly from him. He likes conflict. He likes to have conflict on his own staff. He likes to hear people on his own staff with strong opinions fight it out right in front of him. Uh, he he enjoys that. He uh, joked at the gridiron over the weekend that he is uh, that he enjoys chaos. Uh, he now now uh, denies chaos today uh, via, via Twitter, uh, but clearly. Uh, he is somebody that likes to have that kind of uh, tumult around him. That's the way he operated at Trump Tower. Uh, that's the way he operates here at the White House. And that was, uh, that was a pretty candid admission. By the way, he was asked directly about Sessions, and he, he gave up a chance there to come out and tell the world that he has confidence in his attorney general. Maybe just de-escalating it a, a, a little bit. Uh, John, I want to ask you about another thing he was, he was uh, asked about today, which is handling Russia. Kind of an intriguing question from a Swedish journalist in the room about how Sweden should handle Russia if Russia tries to meddle in its elections, also in 2018. Uh, certainly there was meddling, the president said, but then he moved on pretty quickly from that. Uh, yeah, I thought it was a very good question uh, from the Swedish side. Uh, the, uh, the, the question was what advice he would have, uh, given the experience that the Americans have uh, had in the last election with Sweden, which is having national elections in September. And uh, he, he did, the first thing he said, Rick, was that the Russian meddling had no impact on the election, no impact whatsoever, uh, but then did have that bold, direct statement, there was meddling, but immediately, the next sentence, talked about how there may have been other other countries involved and other people involved, and asked if he was concerned about meddling in the midterm elections. He said, no, they've taken you know t uh, tremendous measures to prevent that. It's a mystery what measures he's referring to. You know, the director of the National Security Agency was up on Capitol Hill and quite bluntly uh, said in congressional testimony that uh, he has not been given the authority he needs to aggressively go at Russian meddling at its source. Uh, seemed to be a direct statement from Admiral Mike Rogers that he does not have the authority from the president that he needs to really fight this growing threat, a growing threat, he said, of Russian meddling. Not just the threat that we saw in the last election, but one that is aggressively continuing as we go into our, our, our next election. And John Carl, one last headline I, I want to I want to hit you with before you you head back there. North Korea, the president uh, joking that what makes the North Koreans wanting to wanting to, to talk. He said me. <laughs> he said nobody nobody got that joke. Uh, but hey, this hey is Rick, a, I'm Rick. I'm not sure that was a joke. I mean, I, I know. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I don't know. I don't <laughs> maybe know. that's why no one laughed. <laughs> yeah. Maybe maybe he meant it. But but what what is the White House attitude toward this uh, this seeming reversal from the North Koreans? It seems like we've moved a long way since fire and fury. Uh, we have, and what we have heard from senior White House officials is that diplomacy is, is the main effort here now. Of course, the military always develops contingency plans, uh, but what I've been told by several very senior officials in this White House is the emphasis is on diplomacy, is on pressuring uh, the North Koreans this latest round of sanctions. And I often wonder, uh, Rick, you know, I've been covering the North Korean nuclear threat uh, for, uh, I don't know, for longer than I care to admit, and, you know, there's always a new round of sanctions. How much left is there to sanction North Korea? But they insist, officials, that this latest round that uh, has been put in place is really hurting the North Koreans, that the Chinese have been more cooperative in the past, and the North Koreans are feeling the pressure. And that's why they say we're seeing uh, some movement on the part of the North Koreans. But there's also caution, you know, that, that, that this is a long way to go, a very, very long way to go. And John Carl, we would have let you admit how many years you've been covering North Korea. That would have been uh, perfectly fine. Uh, at least two or three. I don't know. Okay, <laughs> fine, fair enough. Uh, John Carl at the White House. Thanks for thanks for being here. Uh, All right, thanks. Uh,
Mary, I want to circle back with you on uh, on the on a few points here because it, it, one of the interesting dynamics to me of this news conference is that the president was being challenged at least uh, at least uh, subtly by the Swedish prime minister, uh, talking about trade and the importance of free trade, talking about immigration, uh, a little bit of pushback at the the rhetoric the president's had there. He's hearing from a lot of people, friends, allies, enemies, advice from uh, from from lots of folks. It doesn't seem to be changing the president's mind, but it isn't stopping people from trying. Yeah, it certainly was interesting to sort of see the not so subtle messages coming there uh, from, from the Swedish prime minister to, to President Trump. But you're right, it doesn't seem to be moving the ball forward in any kind of way here. I mean, on tariffs, we're going to have to see how this plays out, what the president ultimately does, because as we mentioned earlier, those mixed messages coming from the White House, it's kind of hard to see where what he's going to do next, if or, or how he's going to soften his stance, whether he will uh, sort of you know, cave in some ways to some of the pressure from members of his own party on this issue and, and, and on immigration. That issue that came up, of course, you remember just yesterday was the deadline up here to, to act on Dreamers. That was the president's own deadline that he set. That deadline came and went without any action here on Capitol Hill. And, and, and again, it's one of these things that we simply don't know how this is going to play out uh, in the coming months. But certainly interesting to watch all of the people publicly and privately trying to sway this president on these various key issues. All right, Mary Bruce, our congressional correspondent, will let you get back to the beat. Thank you, Mary. Thank uh, you, guys. And, and Catherine, uh, I like conflict. That might be the, the, the quote that's remembered out of, uh, out of this news conference. It was interesting, as John mentioned, he, he made that joke over the weekend, I like chaos. Then he tweets, I, uh, there's no chaos. Things are, things are going great. He does create that atmosphere. He does. And the tweet this morning fuels the narrative of this, right? You see, he says, people come and go. Well, there's a list of about 10 people who we can, who we can list off that, you know, aren't necessarily on good standing, on good footing with the president. Um, so he does uh, create this tension internally as well. And a White House official texted me this morning, actually, about this particular tweet and compared it to The Apprentice. Um, <laughs> you know, it's, it's really, it's, it's, you know, who goes next? He says, there's no chaos, only great energy. So uh, chaos versus conflict, it is something that um, he does fuel and, and also has a lot of people scratching their heads internally. And no questions about Sam Nunberg, despite that uh, bizarre <laughs> sequence of interviews that he gave yesterday about this uh, potential testimony for Bob Mueller. Yeah, no, no questions about Sam Nunberg. And, you know, while he was on um, cable television for hours uh, yesterday, um, the president hasn't reacted to this yet. He's surely seen it. It's uh, surely been um, brought to his attention. But we all thought we'd wake up with another uh, presidential tweet about this. Um, surely he um, isn't a big fan of these comments, <laughs> uh, but no questions on it any hasn't weighed in yet. So. Yeah, surprising to have surprising. a number free couple of hours on Very uh, cable surprising. TV. And beyond. <laughs> All right, Catherine Falders. Uh, for everyone here at ABC News, I'm ABC News political director Rick Klein. Download the ABC News app. You can keep us post keep your post up posted all day long at abcnews.com. Thank you for watching.